Hey guys, this is Lance and Matt, and you're listening to Project Offbeat, a podcast that helps you explore careers outside your usual corporate setup. Oi, Lance, how are you? Hi, hi, Matt. Uh, good evening. No, um, you know, just coming from uh, a weekend, like shopping, kami sa Trinoma. Um, you know, it, it's so Bit seldom. <laughs> no, no, it's it's with it's with the family. I I usually reserve my my Sundays with my family. No, but it's it's really seldom na we really get the chance to bond with the complete family because my sister is a doctor, no? Uh, but yeah, thanks for the, to the question. Um, nakapahinga naman during the weekend. We're shooting now on a Monday para sa mga guests natin. So I'm really, really excited for this show. Um, sana, sana marami tayo matutunod today, Matt. And slowly, I think things are getting back to normal here in the Philippines, no? Actually, for I'm sure. going to go to the office this Thursday, so I'm really excited. But, For sure. I uh, know. Let's get this started, no? Uh, we can't keep our guests waiting. Uh, in today's episode, we're featuring the off-beaten career of an athlete whose sport isn't often as recognized under the national spotlight, but in recent years has gained a following thanks to his talent, success, and ever-inspiring story to be the best in the world. Our speaker is a super national athlete, a PH national record holder in both the indoor and outdoor pole vault, and current Asian pole vault holder after setting a 5.93 meter clearance last September 2021. He's proudly represented the Philippines and won multiple prestigious international competitions, including World Universal Games, Asian Athletics Championships, Southeast Asian Games, and was a finalist in the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. Grabe uh, Matt, no? It's a lot of... Um, <laughs> it's, there's a lot of competitions here. There's a lot of words here, but... Basically, this guy, you know, is able to jump at the average heart of, of three cars stacked or basically parang dalawang kai soto yun, no? So imagine being, kai able soto to, <laughs> being able to jump that high, Matt, uh, is something to behold. So as of 2020 uh, of June, he is currently ranked number six in the latest men's mm. pool ball world rankings and even aptly called as the Philippine Eagle in our country. Grabe, talaga nakaproud maging Pinoy kung may mga ganito tayong athletes. Indeed, indeed. Our guest today is Filipino Olympian, national athlete, and pole vault superstar, Ernest John Obiena, or as he is more popularly called, EJ. He joins the Project Offbeat podcast today to talk about the sport he loves, the wins, and challenges along the way. He is joining us all the way from Formia. Good evening from us, and uh, I guess good afternoon from there, no, EJ. Uh, welcome to the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for having me. And uh, excited to do this. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really curious what, what you guys are having today <laughs> for me. <laughs> all right. All right. So I guess first off, no, let's just give an update to uh, our fellow, you know, our fellow countrymen. How are you? Like, uh, can you talk about where you currently are? Uh, I know you participated in maybe back-to-back competitions. Uh, with the most recent uh, being the jump and fly in Mosingen. Uh, congratulations, yep. by the way, uh, on the win. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I got back yesterday. Um, it's been a busy week. Um, I went to back to back to back competition. Ah, that so, low. You know, okay. Yeah, it's it's not it's not fun sometimes, but you know I got COVID. I need to maximize what I have and defend some of the points that I I did. Um, yeah, but I mean. I'm I'm doing okay. Still, I think still recovering from all of that. But you know, uh, happy to take a couple of wins here and there. And yeah, looking forward to what's what's up ahead. All right, all right. Well, before we get to your story, I think it's important for our listeners today to know to understand the difficulty in your sport. And we mentioned how not a lot of people totally understand your sport. Uh, can you enlighten how it is played, like in your own words, no? Um, I mean, pole vaulting in a in the most simplest form is just basically jumping over a stick using another stick. You mm-hmm. know, that's the the most simplest simplest thing. But then the rules of the game are it gets a bit more complicated. In every height, the athlete gets three attempts, and the moment he missed three consecutive att- attempt on that height, he's considered as out. So the bar goes from low to high, and then you get you know, in the in each progression, you get um, three attempts. But then there's tactics uh, that are in play that you can 
work around it. You know, you want to put pressure on the on the other guy, you can skip the height. Or if you feel really confident on that day, you can start a little bit higher. It really comes down to your tactics and your game plan on that day. Um, but I think what's one of the, probably, yeah, one of the most interesting thing about pole was that we actually compete about to each other, but then we're more actual we're well, at least for me, I'll speak for myself. You know, I, mm. I'm more focused on the bar and it's not really the competition. You know, I just want to be the guy who jumps the highest. So there's a weird thing going on that we're all like friendly, not everyone, but we're kind of friendly at each other and cheering everyone up because at the end of the day, we're actually against ourselves over that bar. So that's an interesting fact. And um, you said it's kind of hard. I think the worst thing about being a pole vaulter is just traveling with the poles. <laughs> it's the worst. Um, you know, just imagine traveling with a 17 feet pole or like 520 ish through Europe with the plane. That's already just difficult. And then going out of the plane, finding a car that can actually carry your poles to the track as another you know another struggle it is truly a challenge for us and i think that's what makes us pole vaulters kind of vibe around each other because you know we we get the struggle we get that people right especially in the philippines they go like oh onion bazooka <laughs> you know like <laughs> no joke like and right. people like i i remember um a couple of uh my fellow athletes were were stopped by police because they thought it was like a bomb and well, my <laughs> oh. friend was just like yeah exactly. it's 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 kind of dumb for us to to put a bomb in like a really mm. big piece of thing that would attract everyone's attention so <laughs> long story short yeah it's hard to be a pole vaulter traveling around because of right. of the equipment itself e- EJ are you able to enlighten us uh, first of all hindi ba na, hindi ba parang natutupi yung yung poles uh, I really don't know how it looks like no and second uh, how- how does it feel kapag tinatamaan ka dun sa mga poles? Parang nakakatakot. Like, I can imagine, like, if you missing missing your mark, right, and hitting those poles, does it hurt, right? Uh, would you be able to enlighten us? Well, first, like, poles are, they're, they're one solid piece. That's why oh they bend, God. you know, equally because, and then there's like a, a sail piece and characteristic and different brands, but they're definitely one piece. You can't cut it. You can't bend it. You can bend it individually, but you cannot bend them when they're packed in a in a in a case where we travel. It is painful to land on those <laughs> because uh, the 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 stick it is meant to break when you land on it, but then it's supposed to be stiff enough to be straight. You know, right. st- straight when it's put on that um, standards. Yeah. So it is painful. I, I landed just, I, I guess, four days, four or five days ago on one in a, yeah, I mean, I have a big bruise on my back and oh, damn. kind of sore, but, you know, it is, it is part of the, it's part of the job. It's part of my, my, my sport. And that's why you, you make sure you don't touch it and leave it up there. Just an additional, I guess, context. How many competitions do you usually um, join on in a given year? I know that you can technically qualify for some leagues. You can join other competitions. I, I don't know. Uh, can you like enlighten us on that aspect of it? Well, it depends on, on how, how long the season is. Um, back in 2019, was one of the longest seasons I've ever done because the, the world championship, our calendar revolves around the world championship, mm. you know, the major mm-hmm. championship mm-hmm. going on. So at that time, it was ending in October and we started like April. So that was April, May, June, July, August, September, October, like seven months of a season. And that's only the outdoor. And then we have indoor season, which is starting like mid January to March. Technically speaking, like what I just did last week is like three competitions in one week. You can do that. But then, you know, you're, I'm like, I'm really tired right now. (laughs) I probably need like a week of just recovery and try to keep my, my, my fitness. But for me personally, in, in the indoors, I do maybe six, seven competitions. And then outdoors, I'll probably do like around 20, 20 competitions and not more, but depends on the situation, you know, like sometimes uh, opportunity presents itself to you and you're given a chance to compete in a, in a really prestigious meet, even if it's not part of your calendar, you're not going to say no to that. You know, it's like getting a wild card entry in a, in a slam. You're not going to say 
I know I'm tired. You know, you're just going to go out there and, yeah. you know, um, maximize that opportunity. Especially if, sure. you know, your competitors are also there, diva. Right? So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I, I think, EJ, I, I wanted to highlight on that. No? You were mentioning that there, there are days that you, you, you do three competitions in a week. Uh, but there are times man, that you really have to recover for so long. For, for, for people, because when they look at athletes, sometimes they judge them na parang, oh, you only play like, for a basketball player, you only play like 82 games, right? And uh, for an athlete like you, you only play 20 games and you get the big bucks, right? I think what people don't understand is in these 20 games that you do, the, the, the preparation leading towards it is heck, right? I mean, it's intense, right? Would you be able to enlighten us on that? No, being a national athlete, you you play only a couple of games a year, pero sobrang hirap ba nung preparation going to that uh, time? I'm still waiting for that big box, man. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> uh-huh. in, in my field of sport, it's not that big of a money. You know, it's there's, it's not like tennis, it's not like basketball. There's no big right. box, but yeah, I mean, I think. If you're gonna consider like the time that we actually spend in competition, it's it's short. It's like mm. what two hours? Exactly. But then you know to be at that point, you need to master that skill. You know, um, it's like uh, why do you pay an architect so much if he's just gonna work at that design for like a 100%. day? Because you know, there's a lot, there's a ton of of skill that he actually developed. That's why he's so efficient or he's so good at what he does because all of that skill that he learned from the past or the things that he practiced, like for us, the hours that we put in the track, that's the one that that makes it somehow effortless going into the competition. But, you know, don't be fooled by that and saying like, oh, yeah, Paul Walters are lazy because we have like that tendency. Oh, you're just running 40 meters going to the pit. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you don't mm-hmm. train so much, but and that aspect of the vault, there's so much things going on. It's Definitely. like the runway is, is a track. That's that's track and field. You know, that's speed. That's plain and simple running speed. Then takeoff, that's like a long jump. You know, that's long jump. That's that's You need leg strength. You need to do weightlifting. You need to do multiple technical sessions to understand and or, or learn that explosiveness of that takeoff. Then after yeah, that, yeah. it's gymnastic. So you need to learn like Kaloy. I asked him for stuff to, to understand wow. how can I actually be efficient when going, getting upside down while loading the pole. And these things are are not something that you can just learn in a you know in a in a in a whim, basically. You mm-hmm. you put time, you put effort, and you still hope in the day that you need all of that to push through and just hope that it works. You know, that's that's basically I think everything in life nothing comes in I, I truly believe that there's nothing in life that is worth attaining without effort so yeah. you need parang, to parang there's science behind behind what you guys yes. do right that, behind that takeoff <clears throat> and, no yes Grabe. would you say would you say EJ that you're a, a natural jumper you know ever since you were born you you jump uh high or it really took so many iterations no so many training before you were able to achieve you know this level of jumping abilities i i sucked <laughs> to be honest when I was <laughs> really <here>. I <laughs> <sucked>. <laughs> you know it's uh it's a sport that takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort and i think that's what that's the beauty of it there's a lot of things for me to work on there's a lot of things for me to improve so there's always going to be new and greater heights for me to achieve and i think that's the challenge of it but if you're asking if i was a natural no maybe i was good in philippines I was a decent in Southeast Asia. I was a nobody in Asia. You know, I was nothing oh. in the world, definitely. Wow. Um, I never, I didn't even qualify in the world juniors. Uh, so that's a uh, under 20 championship for like, you know, young, young guys. I didn't qualify for that. That's how terrible I was <laughs> when I was young. So, you know, I, I work my, myself and learn and put my heart out, you know, day in, day out in the track and inch my way into new heights and, greater and greater achievements and yeah that's why i i respect that work i respect that process and i i truly believe that you know nothing nothing is nothing is given you need to work with everything that you you value right and lance i i I saw actually ej's there was a video that ej put out before i guess the tokyo olympics where ej was was running on the track he was doing uh, these hurdles 
He was doing the gymnastic rings also. He was doing weight. So he incorporates a lot of disciplines into this one sport. So para nangita namin sa training regimen na you are actually like applying all of these learnings or insights from all of all of these sports. And well said na you work your your butt off to achieve greater and greater heights. Pretty well said, no. Pero I guess let's get into the career part of it all, no. How did you discover your passion for this sport specifically? I think there's there's going to be two points in time where I would say you know how I discovered my passion in in, in polo. I mean, I I'm kind of I was born into a family of athletes. My mom was a hurdler, my dad was a pole vaulter. Kind of is pretty straightforward, you know, but my parents they saw it as a a ticket for me to get into to a good school, you know. It wasn't truly mine. It wasn't something that I actually felt like I want to do for you know for until where I'm now you know I never thought like oh I want to actually compete and represent the country be be an Olympian do all of these um, I think not even my parents did think that's that's doable or that's possible at the time all I wanted to be honest during that time until maybe 2017 was to get in a good school which mm-hmm. I was able to do you know like ended high school I was able to go to Ateneo and then to USD and you know do all of these and and get a free ride basically full scholarship you know that's something that helps my parents helps mm-hmm. me get a better education but then you know slowly i i got a scholarship to train in in italy uh from from time to time like two two months in a year and then i my eyes kind of got opened and then i still am just you know i'm i'm going through the phases you know i'm i'm wasn't as dedicated i was hard working you know i was going through the phases of of every thing but then it wasn't mine it wasn't mine until it was taken away you know basically i kind of took pole vault thing for granted you know i was okay i was good mm-hmm. i was winning saudi station games but you know i wasn't like a, a force to be reckoned with in in asia or a name to to know in the world so I guess and now I can say it's a blessing in disguise. I torn my ACL at MCL one night in in Philippines oh back God. in 2017, and you know, one time I'm on I'm, I'm on top of the world, and then the next thing you know, I can't walk. You know, like the basic human, yeah, mode of transportation, walking. I can't, and I'm just like, I'm supposed to be an athlete. I'm supposed to to be this, you know, prime in my prime physical f- physique and Yeah, and I'm I can't. And then that's the moment where you know I had the decision to kind of make, and I had this time to actually feel: Do I actually want to continue? Because I mean, I was I was decent. I, I hold the Southeast Asian record. Mm. I I'm I'm already the best Filipino who have ever done the sport at that time. Am I done? You know, I'm like, why why go through that hell? You know, why why am I gonna go through that hell to actually just pull? And then that's I think the second time where I actually chose pole vault. You know, that's where my 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 passion, my 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 drive for it, it came as a something while I was in rehab. You know, to go through rehab and be back as a normal person, it is totally hundred percent doable from my torn ACL. Right. But everybody knows if you want to be back better than before, you need to just do two or three folds of what normally should be done. And I hated, to be honest, I hated every moment of that. I just, it, it sucked. It, it really sucked because I'm trying to get back to where I'm at, not knowing if I'm going to be ever be back. You know what I mean? After a, a possible career-ending injury, having that doubts makes okay. you ponder, makes you think that hey, maybe this is not worth my while. You know, maybe I'm better off finishing school and just doing. What most of the people are doing, which is the most and probably the most logical thing to do, mm. yeah. But but I, I I felt something inside, and I I knew that I was gonna regret it, and you know I saw it as a as a chance for me to do it again, and I didn't care if I'm not gonna be as good as I was, and I I really didn't care at that time if if I would ever jump higher than I have ever jumped. At that time, it was more like I know I need to give this a go. I you wanted know, to prove yourself, not not just prove myself. It was more like I want to give myself a chance to be an mm. Olympian because I felt like yeah. I wanted that, 
And, you know, as, a, as an athlete, our career is maybe at 30, 35. After right. that, I'm done. After exactly. that, even if I want to, even if I push myself, it's just physically impossible to be at your prime at that age. So I knew I need to try. And if I don't try now, I'm going to regret it when I'm 40 and nice. I'm 50. And I'm, I'm just like, I need to snap the sorry snap the shit out and just be be working as hard as i can and give this the best shot i ever have and luckily it kind of paid off uh you know as, as you were saying a while ago it's <laughs> like you know um that that conversation with my parents was tough and you know those those days that i'm not vaulting as high as i should and or i could or you know as i was it's tough and yeah, but I had that, that that decision that I said, you know, I need to give myself the best shot ever in this Olympics. And yeah, I, I just needed to admit it as well that, you know, logically I had the deadline and I, this is maybe probably the, the cherry on top for my parents to just allow me to do what I want to do. I said, if I don't qualify, don't worry, I'll be done. I'll go no, back yeah. to school. I'll finish everything. I'll, I'll forget about pole vault and move on. That's, that's that's just the reality of it you know i have what well, at that time i had two years so you know yeah it was that was probably where i could say pole thing is my decision and it is actually mine it is my passion it is me who decided it is not my parents it's not anyone else it is me and uh ej could could you um i think earlier you mentioned the but you broke your acl and your mcl no um, being a fan of the NBA myself, um, and I idolized Derrick Rose growing up, no, um, and he has the exact same story as you, right? He was on top of the game. He was the MVP then, and but he tore his ACL. And I read every article about him, and they talked about how it's more, of, uh, it's really both a psychological and a physical battle. Uh, like you earlier mentioned, the ex- ganon na ganon eh, na parang uh, mas takot ka na ngayon eh. Diba? Takot ka na na ma- ma- re-injure mo sarili mo, right? Parang you have to or, trust your body exactly, again. Exactly. You, yeah. you have to trust your body again and really work work up uh, that much. No? EJ, could you could you share to us, wala bang parang insurance um, sa mga pole vault athletes na say, ma-injure ka at this point in your time, uh, you're covered uh, uh, the rest of the way or uh, you really had to uh, give it your all or else you'll lose everything that you started on? Um, I think nobody would ever not not a single insurance company would actually insure pole vaulters. I mean, just the idea of it kind of <laughs> is, uh, you know, it's it's still a business at the end of the day. And I don't think they're going to make a bet of that. And, but I'm lucky to have a, a sponsor like Allianz who who does because they mm. believe in me and they, they trust exactly. me. And, you know, of course, I represent the country, the, the company as well. But I mean, like, you, like I just want to, be clear you know it's not that you're afraid to kind of re-injure yourself you're more worried that you're not going to be the same mm-hmm. and that was me for maybe a, a year or two i was like you know i've been trying to be back to where i was i want to feel the same that i felt before i tore my acl until one day i just accepted it. it's not going to be the same but doesn't mean i'm not yeah, going to be babe. better you know and then i think I, I did follow Derek Rose because, you know, the youngest MVP, Tornius ACL. And, you know, as an athlete myself, I need to kind of learn on, on what the things that he did right and what are the things that he did wrong. And I have another guy from South Africa who torn his ACL uh, two months after I tore mine. Yeah, but- and, you know, we, we just exchange uh, references and like on the things that we're doing and like what exactly you know of course i don't talk to Derek rose but he has like written <laughs> stuff and then you yeah. know the physios and then these blogs and just try to follow it even reddit you know i just read about okay so at which phase and which phase yeah, are they... these and you know i think what what Derek was was probably i would say extra well but then at the same time just the timing is off he he was very aggressive he was very aggressive to get back he wanted to be back and I think that's that's one of the things that every athlete would would want to do, because you know you can't do what you, yeah. It, it kind of sucked to can you imagine you you want to do your work, but your work needs to be in that office. But then you can just keep doing that 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 
commute going to work but then the moment you go to the to your office you can't do your work but then you're just going to commute every single day continuously doing the same sure. hassle but then you never know the moment you knock on the door in the office if that's going to open you know that that kind of sucked and yeah. yeah i mean it made me a better person that that injury made me a better person and uh, i think a little bit stronger a little bit smarter and well, at that time i didn't believe that but you know now i i do now i i, I do believe that it's it made me a better athlete at some point like what kelly williams said to me mm, kelly williams yeah i i, I bet in, in in those times that you were recovering you also built up your muscles right that's what they say like you're all day weightlifting and and really running oh, yeah. around right so i think that's also i one. was big <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I guess I uh, know we we kind of touched upon it already but you went through this process of uh recovering from your ACL injuries and obviously it was that for a while for for maybe one to two years as you mentioned but uh, talk to us about getting to that national athlete level can you talk about that journey to get to the top of the game the world class level and how big is the difference like Can you give us insight on the competition, uh, the training, the expectations, etc.? It is. It's first of all, it is tough to be a national athlete in any country in the world. It's tough, but it's tougher to be a Filipino national athlete. There's just these mm. um, obstacles that not all athletes around the world needs to go through, and Filipino athletes go through that. Every single one of us. It just it is just a fact. It is just being born a Filipino athlete. Mm. We just need to be a little bit tougher if you want to be where the others are. You know, not I'm not saying that you know this is a disadvantage, but it is something that you need to go through. You know, being a third world country, not having all these fancy gadgets and and just the the knowledge of it as well. Mm. That's something that. Not a lot of the Europeans here that I compete with needs to go through. So it is, it is tough. Um, you can ask probably every national athlete; they're going to say the same thing. You know, it is, it is a, uh, especially right now, it is tough to be a national athlete to a level. In in my opinion, Southeast Asian Games, I respect everyone who competes there, but it is not, it is not the pinnacle of sport. The moment you step into Asian, challenges start to pick up, and you know more things. More things gets a little bit more complicated. It gets a little bit tougher, and now you're competing in the Asian region. It is right. one of the biggest continents in the world. And then, if you want to be the best in the world, where Hidalin stepped already and showed yeah. that the Filipino can do it, that's a whole totally just maybe three or four folds more, you know, to be a national athlete is hard to be a Southeast Asian games representing the country. It's tough, but it's, I would say it's not as tough as it is because, you know, from my experience, it is tough, but not as tough as it is, but then going to the Asian level, it's maybe two, three times more. And then the world is just another five, five, six times more. Wow. I I can't, I don't know how to relate to it. How, how I can like give an example on how, how that level kind of progress or how that level, mm -hmm. I, I mean, to just kind of have a measurement, it, it's kind of tough, but in one word, it is just hard. I think, although in, in basketball sense, it's really more of the competition. You're, you're faring against way bigger athletes, way, you know, more, more conditioned athletes. Um, is, is it on your case, is it more of like the expectation that the, whole country is on your shoulders or well the pressure of of one country yeah, i love that i i just wow. i live for that that's something that that i i enjoy because that that gives me you know when you feel pressure it means you're about to do something historic that's something that people would probably remember or Beautiful. something expected of you something you know that's not a lot of people that's not a lot of people can say yeah i feel pressure to do something right you know And it's a privilege to have that position. It is truly is. And I think my, my greatest challenge is probably just the knowledge of it. You know, I, it took me 18 years to get to a scholarship and took me 
another six to kind of learn, you know, how actually this high level pole vaulting is. And until now I'm still learning, which a lot of the Europeans that I compete, which they start with this, you know, they, they're born with a series of poles that they're going to go through. They have all the equipment that they would need because, you know, it's been done. It's been paved, you know, the way to reach that has been paid, but as a Filipino athlete, there wasn't, you know, there, there wasn't right. like, oh yeah, you need to go through this polls. These are going to be your equipment. This is what you're going to do. These are the competition at your age group. You know, these is what are the marks that you want to do? No, you know, at, when I started, my dad was basically trying to do his best to know what I'm supposed to do. And that's why he said, you know, when I reach five meters, which he never reached, he said, I can probably push you for another 10, 15 more, but I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, and that, you know, that's, that's the time where, you know, I need to find my, my way, keep yeah, knocking right. on doors and trying to figure things out. And I think, yeah, those are the things that not, I'm, I'm sorry to say, not all other athletes around the world needs to do because they have history, they have the knowledge, they have the technology, or even sure. they have the funds to hire these high level coaches, which unfortunately at that time the Philippines didn't have. Thank you for sharing to us that yung yung hirap na actually hindi yan nakikita sa headlines eh. Hindi yan nakikita sa mga, di ba, yung mga hirap na athletes na navigating where to go next, right? Um, how to become better, right? I mean, I could imagine it's like LeBron James trying to learn a new move next season but no one has done it before right so what how will he learn that right how will yeah. he create that that move right so thanks ej um really for for sharing that one and i think Thank it's you. really really important because like what we see from athletes such as yourself for example is usually the output which is nanalo siya ng sea games nanalo siya ng yeah. universade or or went as a finalist as to, uh, in the tokyo olympics but you don't really know the whole story which is like the training the everyday struggle how to move your poles from one country to another so i think you know i think it's really important to have this conversation with you today so that not only you know uh, aspiring athletes know the struggle to get there to your level but also corporate people have a, a bigger appreciation for what you do to kind of represent the country and i think that brings me to uh the next uh, question that I have is that we've tackled a lot of the difficulties of uh, of your sport of of the game of being a national athlete of the Philippines. Do you have one best moment for you that made it all the difficulties and sacrifices worth it? Actually, there's a lot. I mean, hmm. you know, as much as it is, it is tough. It is enjoyable. That's why I'm still here. You know, that's why I'm. I'm still doing what I do because I, I enjoy it. I have fun with it. And for some reason, it is still my calling. And until that time, until I say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, this is not fun anymore. This is not what I want to do. Then I'll stop. You know, when I jump 593, which is my, my personal best and yeah, the Asian record, that is something that I'm very proud of. That's, uh, that's like a, a medal of honor for me to be, you know, that, that height basically dubbed the Philippines to have the best pole vault that I've ever lived in the history of the sport. And I don't know, I mean, that is just for me, a big, a big, big pride and honor, you know, to go to competitions and say, yeah, you know, Ernest John of Vienna, the Asian record holder, the best Asian to have ever done the sport. What can I say? I mean, I just love that. I mean, that that's, that's the proof of my work and that's the mm -hmm. you know the time that shows it of course you can never you can never show an athlete's work with just the results but with that you know i did show something and i think i've, I've kind of gave philippines a little bit more significance in the at least in the athletics world right of pole vaulting and then it gave a i'm hoping that it gave the officials that runs the sport a little bit of knowledge that hey filipinos can actually do this we're now the best in nation and then that's why i'm so happy when you know when in the southeast asian games we were one to finish in in the men's pole book which mm. was never done for the past 30 35 years 30 35 years or something like that you know 
Philippines now is, is a force to be reckoned with in Asia. And that is something not a lot of people, again, can say, you know, I freaking did that and I kind of raised that level, you know, as much as these athletes are, you know, I'm able to help them and I'm able to to put Philippines in a... In the map. In yeah. some, you know, yeah, in a map, in some kind of a, you know, now when we go to Southeast Asian Games, knowing that, hey, Philippines has two entries in the pole vault. Oh, we need to be, you know, we need to take care of that. You know, oh, these are, you know, the top dogs of the game right now. You know, the, mm-hmm. the other countries, it's not like I'm, I'm saying, oh, they're they going to shake and, and be afraid. No, but they, they recognize it now. Now they're like, oh, it's not like, oh, there's another Filipino in the list. No, oh, there's a Filipino in the list. You know, right, like, oh, right. oh, damn. You know, that, that's something that I believe I can be proud of. Wow. Grab it. Parang, yeah, that's the dream, no? Parang, hindi that na, sense of par- validation, no? After yeah, parang, so long, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I could imagine it's like nowadays if uh, a Filipino won, a Filipina won the Miss Universe. It's like, yeah, they always win, <laughs> right? They always win somehow, right? Maybe next time sa pole vault, umabot na tayo sa ganun na aspect. I think that's the goal and you paved the way for it, no? So I think that's that's something that's truly, truly, uh, parang a legacy, Right? Wow. Would you would you yes. say would you say EJ it's more of a legacy thing now for you, or it's still really more of a still trying to beat these records and 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 whatnot? I'm gonna sound cocky, but I don't really give a I don't give a damn about that legacy thing. You know, I just, <laughs> really? I'm just here to have fun mm-hmm. and I'm here to do. Maybe it is a bit of a validation, as you you have said before. Right. Um, of course, everybody wants to be appreciated. Maybe it is a bit um, immature for me, but. I, I do love to feel that validation. And I, as I said, you know, I, I, I hung, I'm hungry for that. And I, I do love that. And yeah, it's just something that I'm proud of. I don't know if people in the future are going to be knowing that if my kids or grandkids are going to be even, oh, you know, the, this is my, 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 my ancestor or something, you know, maybe, but right now I couldn't care less. My, my worries like, okay, how am I going to be better? How am I going to compete with these guys that, that are, you know the best of the best in the world right now and yeah i <laughs> i'm just yeah. I'm, I'm as candid as i can be i couldn't care less right now about legacy. <laughs> i'm just here to vote that, that that's the ej mamba mentality you know uh, <laughs> yeah i was about to say it, it it's so like kobe bryant-esque no um, yeah like, eh. <laughs> nowadays because it's like oh media right oh who's the more westbrook is here making his own fashion line <laughs> Here's EJ. I want to. I just want to be better. That's it, man. Uh, no other shiz. We we already mentioned uh, a lot about your mamba mentality and um, and how you're tra- kind of training towards a singular goal. But like, do we have a chance to actually surpass these top five people, uh, top five world class pole vaulters? No. I get that. I ask that every single day, and I ask that every single day to myself whenever I compete because yeah, I want to be the best. Um, right. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not going to be powered to, to say, yeah, I, I, I just want to be second. No, I said it and I'm going to say it again. When I compete, I want to win. Right. If I don't win. It sucks. I'm not there to take second. I'm not there to take third. I'm there to win. Oof. And you know, I, maybe people are going to say, Oh, I'm you're cocky. Yeah. But I do believe I can. That's why I'm still here. You know, I'm not here for the, the long game i'm not here as i said you know i'm waiting i'm still waiting for that big bucks man and uh <laughs> there's not big bucks in track i'm sorry to say there's just not it's not a sport that is um gonna pave my life forever so until i believe that i can beat the best and i can be the best then i'm still here but then the moment i i probably understand hey yeah this is the best that i can do then it's time for me to walk away mm. and continue my life and right. it is it might be today it might be tomorrow it might be the next year it might be the next 10 years who knows but as long as i believe i can and i can still beat these guys and you know have that challenge to actually go through it and believe that i can overcome it yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm motivated you know i'm i think that's that's just sport it is you know uh, as long as you believe you you keep trying and you never truly lose it and I'm just going to say it, winning is addicting. It's, mm, it's yeah. a very nice feeling, man, to win. And I, I want that. And I, I keep 
um, going for that for bigger, bigger, bigger achievements and bigger competitions. Yeah, and EJ, nothing's impossible. Yeah, yeah. Things may yeah, play out. You're in. You're within striking distance, basically, to yeah. you know the top spot. So right. you know, right. I hope uh, on behalf of the Filipino people, I hope you continue, and you know, continue <laughs> your work. No, I hope, EJ, are those so. day, are there days that you, you tell yourself? Ako nga, wala akong masyadong resources, no? But I'm faring against these guys. All the more, paano kung may resources ako and and my country has all of these technologies? Ay. You guys are, you guys are, are you guys are shit, right? Uh, do you that, ever that, think that's that? That's the uh, Filipino way. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, also, right? that's what I just say. You know, that's what I just say to everyone. Um, being a Filipino has its perks and that's one of the things that I, I truly believe. You know, I work a little bit harder probably not because, it, oh, EJ is just a hard worker. No. Me being a Filipino growing up in Tondo, having all of these wow. struggles, your 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 level of um, your Operan. level of uh, endurance, yeah, you yeah. you can just endure a little bit more than Resiliency. you know. Yeah, Resiliency. I've I've trained with the world champion. I've trained with the Olympic champion. I've trained with the Chinese guys, and I can see it. You know, I can see somehow in some way. I'm not bragging that. Yeah, I'm I'm the hardest working guy in the group, but I I I, I took I take pride in that, and I think it's just. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a freaking Filipino. What can I say? That's that's every time. That's what I say to my coach, and he was telling me, to, "There's three guys right now in my group, and I'm the only one who did back to back to back." So wow. the first guy did back to back, and then he said, "Yeah, I'm tired. I don't want to do the other one." The Chinese guy said, "Okay, I'm going to do the first one in the last meet," and then I said, "No, I'm going to do all three. You know, and then yeah, my coach man. is telling me the last competition, "You're probably tired, right?" And it's like. Yeah, but I'm Filipino. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. It, it just, yeah. There's a sense of pride into that. I love, I love the mentality, Lance. Uh, I'm so happy that EJ is on our podcast right now. Um, I get. Well, let's get to uh, our next section, which is what's in it for our audience. So, any advice or any thing you want to tell uh, people who would want to kind of pursue being an athlete maybe do you have any tips or advice for them on how to get started well i think to start to be an athlete uh, we need to define what's an athlete i think an athlete mm, is right. whoever is doing athletics you know doing anything that kind of is a training you know even if even a guy who plays chess is an athlete so i guess you just need to have right. fun first on what you do um it's not the most important thing every single day but it is probably the most important thing to get started. And then the moment you have fun, you understand that, you know, losing sucks, but you're still having fun. Mm -hmm. So you want to get better. You know, at least that's how I see it. It's right. I, I, I lost a lot of times, but then the moment I won, it's, it just made everything worthwhile. Yeah. I guess have fun, look for the thing that you're very passionate about so that, you know, you enjoy it, but at the same time you give your all and you give, like you guys, you know, this podcast is something that you guys really want to do. This is why you stay up late and look for these um, people to to have in your podcast for that same. You're passionate about this. You enjoy it. And then, you know, you put your heart out into it. And yeah, I mean, before that, you need to be enjoying things. You, you, you and you guys enjoy this. And yeah, yeah. The people who are <laughs> going to be at these needs to enjoy whatever they're going to be doing may it be pole vaulting sprinting basketball tennis chess mm. weightlifting gymnastics whatever it would be you need to be enjoying it and having fun and, you know be passionate about it ej are there any um programs or groups um athletes to be um can join or would you recommend anything from the philippine setting from the international setting um any you know uh being someone that you know, hustled your way and navigated through a lot of how to become better athlete, right? Any suggestions on how to become better? Well, to be a pole vaulter right now in Philippines is a bit easier than it was back in my day. So we have a, my dad basically has like a, like a connection now of, mm. of people wow. that we can, you know, help and, and get the athletes at least trained to that level where they're very competitive in the Southeast Asia, which is showing now, you know, right. we, we got yeah. one to finish and just reach out to me or reach out to the, uh, we have a page in Facebook uh, called Philippine Pole Vault Club. 
mm. where you know you can just send us a message if you want to learn pole vaulting and we'll try to get you the best coach near your area awesome or wow. if, if there's not then you know we'll try to get you something just try to sort things out um yeah that's that's something that my dad i think is very proud of something that i think he been very invested in maybe not everyone is going to be an asian record holder maybe not everyone's going to be an olympic champion but you know as i said uh, for me i started pole vaulting as a ticket to get a better better life in a way to get a better education so you know there's a bunch of kids in the province who could actually take advantage of that and you know we have already a couple having a basically so full, awesome. full ride yeah. Ganda, ganda. Uh, I mean, it's just not you being the top of the game in terms of athlete. You're also like creating how to become the grassroots. Yeah, the grassroots, diba? But I remember there's this one tattoo, tattoo masters in the Philippines that joined NAS daily just to propagate and talk more about how to do those unique tattoos, right? And that's what you're doing as well. You're creating basically like a, a community, diba? That people didn't have that before and you're already there. So It's really nice to have someone uh, trailblaze it, diba? Para hindi na ganun kahirap next time, right? So, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, EJ, for, I never, for doing that. I never mm-hmm. realized that, actually. I just realized that. <laughs> 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 I swear, I never realized that. I was just like, yeah, I want to just promote the whole thing and just make it more accessible to people because it is, it is fun. It is something that, of course, I want to see more of us do. Never really thought of it that way, but at the Thanks for that, I guess. Thank you. For sure. Thanks, thanks, EJ, for doing that. So, EJ, uh, we mentioned at the start of this uh, podcast is that we created Project Offbeat uh, for our fellow corporate professionals out there. Uh, we're hoping to open their minds to other careers, other points of view. What do you think your specialization, which is uh, being a national athlete and being part of the pole vaulting world, how do you think that Uh, those mentality or those insights, how do you think it can be applied to the workplace? So, Matt, to Matt, to yeah. give EJ some time as well. I think um, in this episode, I learned something as well. I'm, sure. a, cor- I'm a corporate professional, but what I learned from EJ was that um, even athletes have to navigate their way to learning new skills or oh, learning the one, new, yeah. new techniques and new stuff, right? I mean, I didn't expect that. I thought that there would always be a coach to hey, here's a new skill that you can do. Here's, here's how you can jump high, right? But EJ mentioned earlier, <laughs> it's not that easy. It's not that straightforward, right? So I think sobrang importante nung ingenuity in terms of finding how to become better next, right? Um, yeah, EJ, do you have anything for our corporate guys? Yeah, probably the, the most brutal thing in, in sport is, you know, we're, we're the, like, as much as I hate to say it, we are, defined by our results and i think mm, as a corporate individual yeah. you're also defined by the work that you do it doesn't as much as it sucks you know there are deliverables and there's things that you need to submit every single time and if you don't submit it it is a, a point against you it's the same with us you know in the big competitions you need to show up you need to to be able to deliver and that's where it matters you know knowing when it matters to deliver it is important that we do our best performance at that and i think In the corporate world, it's the same, you know, where the project is very important. You need to be able to deliver the work that you do at the highest quality possible. And if you don't, um, sorry to say, it's reality. Even me, you know, I get mm. kicked out of the team. You know, you you get a you get a pay cut, you know, or you don't get promoted, you know, or you're stuck in the on a I don't know seventy eight job. You know, these things that are harsh reality of of I guess of the world is is that you need to know when you need to deliver and you need to deliver when you need to deliver. It's like, it sounds really dumb, but it is it is a fact. It's just a way of life. And I think another thing is that, as you said, you know, you need to learn a skill and you need to be improving and all of that. And I think just the patience of, of being patient or the patience of learning and being just a better you the next day or the better you in the next month, it's, Something that everybody, not e- not even just in the corporate world, it is something that everybody, I believe, should be aiming for. And mm. it takes patience, you know. Um, uh, Maxwell Glad- Gladwell, I think his name is. He he wrote a book, The Outliers. And well, now it's more famous in like the 10,000-hour rule to kind of learn a skill 
to be called you know uh, a master of it you need at least a 10,000 hours right, of yeah. doing it that might you know that might be for me going in the track doing my craft bolting for 10,000 hours or that might be you working on a program I don't know if you're a video editor maybe that's like you putting 10,000 hours in Final Cut Pro or yeah. Premiere Pro you know um, I don't know but it, it takes time for you to be good at what you do well that's the price that you need to just be paying so I guess those are probably the two things that I I would say are very applicable to the corporate world which is yeah the brutality of of life that you need to do. there are deliverables and there are things that you need to do at the time where you need to do it the best effort and then you know not just effort sorry the best result you know it's just not the effort right. it, it, it it counts but it sucks but yeah. it is the, the, people you know, don't remember the, the effort <laughs> it's exactly. the results, uh, <laughs> right exactly it's like i can work you know i wouldn't be here i can work my my ass off like multiple times but if i don't win if I don't jump high, who's CJ Obiena? He's yeah. a nobody. He doesn't, you know, I, I might have the same approach, but if I don't deliver in the days I need to, it just, it wouldn't matter. And then I guess number two is just be patient on the skills that you need to do, that you need to learn to be better at what you do. You know, there, it takes time. Everything yeah, that's great sure. takes time. For sure. 10,000 hours of podcast, Matt. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, right. We're like well, 1,000 guests to go <laughs> to, meet, to meet that goal. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, EJ, for all of these lessons, all of these insights, and the kind words that you've shared with our audience today. Thank you for taking us off the beaten path. Can you let people know where you are now and what you're excited about in the next few months? Uh, any competitions coming up? Um. Yeah, I mean, right now I'm I'm in Formia. Uh, I'm actually leaving, going to the U.S. in today is the fourth, right? Yeah, in three days. So I'm flying in in California, right. in L.A. in three days to do my uh, acclimatization camp before mm -hmm. the World Championship in in Eugene. So yeah, that's that's something I'm very 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 looking forward to. So you know, that's something I've never won. Something that I believe I'm capable of winning. So yeah, that's something that I'm I'm focused right now. As I said, you know, I'm I'm just want to be a better pole vaulter. I just want to be able to win all the things that I could win. So yeah, that's that's the task at hand. It's something that I I look forward to. We hope the best for you as well. If anyone wants to reach out to you for uh, pole vaulting questions or any other partnership inquiries, uh, how can they contact you? Well, I'm a, I'm a bit old school, so I, I do emails <laughs> most of the time. Um, but you can, of course, send me a DM or hit me up in Facebook or Instagram or wherever. Um, yeah, from time to time, I, I get a bit busy, so I, I, I'm not able to look into it. And sometimes I just get flooded, too. So the best way to reach me is email. And, you know, I have a team of people that are having access to those accounts and I'm able to to focus my, my attention on the things that I actually need to, to put my attention to. So, right. yeah, I guess... Just social media, email, and, and all of that. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, this is a question that we ask all of our off-beaten guests. No? What for you is taking the off-beaten path? So looking back at where you came from as a youth from Tondo to where you are now competing in the world, uh, what for you is taking the off-beaten path? I think for me, it is taking some, you know, sometimes it's not the path that is always logical for me it's not the path that is always uh, making sense sometimes it is the path that you just can't pass you know it's a path that you know it's not making a lot of sense but you know that you just can't pass on this and I think that's that's probably the best decision that you're going to take that leap of faith you put your effort into it you put your back into it you put everything that you got into it and yeah I hope that you get to be successful and i think that is uh, being uh, i guess as you call it offbeat it's you know not a lot of people would take that risk take that jump take that leap of, leap of faith yes a lot of jumping uh <laughs> a lot of jumping funds very take that 5.93 leap of faith no? <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you for listening to the show if you liked our show follow us as well on facebook instagram linkedin and youtube for exclusive content that's at the Project Offbeat.
See you in the next episode. And here's to taking the hashtag off the beaten path. Thank you. Thank you, EJ. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.